Well, on behalf of the Department of Religious Studies, uh, good afternoon and welcome. Dan and Nolan Fuel joined the Drew University faculty in the fall of 2000 as professor of Hebrew Bible at the Theological School and in the Graduate Division of Religion. In 2014, she was named the John Fletcher Hurst Professor of Hebrew Bible. Prior to coming to Drew, she had taught for 13 years at the Perkins School of Theology at Southern Methodist University. She holds an MTS and a PhD from Emory. Professor Fuel's teaching and research interests include literary and cultural approaches to biblical narrative, feminist criticism, the Bible in art and politics, children and biblical literature, and the ethics of reading. During her career, she has been a three-time recipient of the Scholarly Outreach Award, sponsored by the, the Lilly Endowment, as well as a three-time recipient of the Scholar Teacher of the Year Award, sponsored by the General Board of Higher Education and Ministry of the United Methodist Church. In 2015, she was also honored by the students of Drew's Graduate Division of Religion with the Karen McCarthy Brown Award for Excellence in Teaching. In addition to numerous scholarly articles, her published works include Compromising Redemption, Relating Characters in the Book of Ruth, which was nominated for the Jewish Book Award in 1990, Circle of Sovereignty, Plotting Politics in the Book of Daniel, Narrative in the Hebrew Bible, Gender, Power, and Promise, the subject of the Bible's first story, The Children of Israel, Reading the Bible for the Sake of Our Children, and Icon of Loss, The Haunting Child of Samuel Bach. She is the editor of Reading Between Texts, Intertextuality and the Hebrew Bible, and the co-editor of Bible and Ethics of Reading, and representing the irreparable, the Shoah, the Bible, and the art of Samuel Bach. Her most recent publication is the new Oxford Handbook of Biblical Narrative, a volume of 51 essays by some of the world's most noted and most recent authorities on various aspects of biblical narrative. In addition to teaching and writing, Dana has been a general editor of three major book series, Literary Currents and Biblical Interpretation from Westminster John Knox Press, Biblical Limits from Rutledge, and the Samaya Studies published by the Society of Biblical Literature. She also served as program chair for the Reading Theory and the Bible and the Children in the Biblical World sections of the Society of Biblical Literature, as well as president of the Mid-Atlantic region of the SBL. Dana is married. She has a 26-year-old daughter and a 12-year-old Labrador retriever. She and her partner, David, live on a 25-acre farm in Franklin, North Carolina, where they grow most of their food, keep bees and chickens, entertain friends, and enjoy a lovely mountain view. And she said that if we saw it once, we'd want to stay there ourselves. Since Professor Newell has been to Holy Cross once before, please join me in welcoming her back now to the college campus. Okay. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And it's great to be back. Your campus is just as beautiful as it was 20 years ago when I was, when I was here last. Thank you for also for coming out. And uh, even those of you who sat further to the front, you were brave. And you know, I uh, applaud your courage. Let me start. Um, does the Bible really say that? Uh, what does it mean to read religiously in a Bible-tweeting, Bible-thumping culture? A ubiquitous image in current Christian culture. Picture it. 
on a bumper sticker, a t-shirt, a book jacket on display in a local Christian bookstore, a billboard, a Bible radiating a circle of light. Not, not this kind of Bible, but one of those leather-covered floppy kind, right? The Bible radiating this circle of light, and the caption reads, when all else fails, read the instructions. When all else fails, read the instructions. The Bible in popular culture is often depicted as a book of divine instructions. As some of my students tell me, B-I-B-L-E is an acronym, meaning Book of Instructions Before Leaving Earth. I try not to laugh, okay. <laughs> Even our presidents now seem compelled to turn to the Bible for moral guidance. This is the only handbook you need, said George W. Bush, brandishing his Bible during a speech on federal funding for faith-based charities. This handbook is a good go-by. Addressing the violence that has spawned and been spawned by the Black Lives Matter movement, Barack Obama urged, let us love not with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Now he cited the Gospel of John, but he was actually quoting the first letter of John. <laughs> and our current president, Donald Trump, has insisted the Bible is his favorite book. His favorite verse? Well, there are so many, he hedges evasively. But an eye for an eye, he finally claims, is the biblical instruction that can make America great again. Now, consider this. A recent article in Christianity Today asserts that of the 200 billion messages sent on tw Twitter last year, 40 million featured Bible verses. 40 million. Snippets of wisdom, pithy admonitions, curt judgments, bits of the Bible charging through virtual space in response to some question, proposition, or situation. But apparently, nearly half of these Bible tweets were generated by bots, programs designed to auto-create tweets. In other words, Bible spam accounts tasked with nothing but tweeting Bible verses continuously, working on the assumption that biblical quotes need no context, are universally applicable for any occasion, and require no interpretation. Some defenders argue that because it is God's word, even the random scattering of its seed is bound to take root and do good things. But using the Bible like scattershot is a dangerous game. And biblical instruction does not always accomplish good things. <laughs> Understood and used simply as a book of instructions, the Bible, at least in United States cultures, has had a reputation of hitting the harder stuff, but not without a fair number of casualties. It has provided the justification for the conquest and colonization of indigenous lands, for capital punishment, that eye for an eye thing, for denying women the right to vote, for supporting slavery in the antebellum South, and for promoting racial segregation in the 19th and 20th centuries. And as we know, the Bible has had an integral role to play in debates over LGBTQ plus rights, women's reproductive and health care rights, and the fine lines between religious freedom and religious discrimination. When the Bible enters the political fray, it, bring, it brings for some unassailable authority. For others, it brings wounds. For those battered by the Bible, often the only recourse is to counter the Bible with the Bible, 
or at least with a more critical understanding of the Bible's literature and history. And here's a case in point. In June of 2015, when the Supreme Court issued its ruling that the Constitution of the United States guarantees the right to same-sex marriage, there was a dramatic surge of Bible-related searches on the internet. In the first 24 hours following the announcement, there were 178,000 Bible-related tweets, approximately 30% of which cited biblical passages commonly used to debate same-sex marriage. Google witnessed not only a stream of generic Bible-related searches, such as Bible verses about marriage, but also targeted searches, the top five of which were Sodom, Leviticus, End Times, Abomination, and Romans 1. Likewise, Bible Gateway, one of the most popular Bible websites, reported a concomitant increase in activity after the Supreme Court ruling, with 74% of the searches on its site targeting passages used against same-sex marriage. The leading passage sought out was Genesis 19, traditionally known as the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. But in response to the online tweets and blogs citing the Bible in protest of the Supreme Court ruling, there was a remarkable insurgency of writers who both honored the Bible as a sacred text and yet refused to take its religious instruction at face value. There were countless examples of religious readers laying out the constraints of the Bible's ancient historical and cultural context, showing how the Bible is often at odds with itself, and painstakingly referencing overarching moral mandates to care for one another. These online postings seem to understand that the Bible is not a single univocal book, or as we would say in the South, univocal, it's not a univocal book, but a library of works diverging in genre, purpose, cultural context, and theological outlook. Now genre presents a particular challenge, and this is what I want to focus on today. What do you do with narrative, with story, if you were looking for directive instruction. It's one thing to debate whether biblical commandments are applicable in today's world. That's a whole other lecture. You can invite me back. But it's quite another to distill a clear and univocal mandate from a complex story world. Let me give you a somewhat quaint example from my childhood. I grew up 100 years ago in <laughs> a Southern Baptist community in Louisiana. So you might well imagine all the ways in which the Bible was used to control behavior and thought. When I was in the fourth grade, I got in trouble at school for skipping choir rehearsal to go play kiss chase outside with the boys. I don't know, nobody plays kiss chase anymore, right? Back when I was growing up, that was just the most deliciously scandalous thing you could do. And if that weren't bad enough, I lied to my mother about it. Now that brought down the wrath of God, sure enough. And when the smoke from the fire and brimstone had cleared, I was told, you had better go read your Bible, young lady. So, I contritely retrieved the Bible given to me at baptism and retired to a corner to serve my penance. There was just one problem. The Bible is a big book, and I didn't know where to start. So I started at the beginning, Genesis. I read, and I read, and I read, do you know how far you have to read in the Bible before you encounter anything that remotely suggests that you should not lie to your mother? I read story after story of all kinds of folks deceiving each other. <laughs> Abraham lying about his wife being his sister. Jacob lying about being his brother Esau. Rebecca misleading her husband. Rachel lying to her father Laban, Joseph deceiving his brothers, 
And the book of Exodus was no better. There, God instructs Moses to lie to Pharaoh in order to bring about the exodus from Egypt. Deception seemed to be the order of the day. And with God himself condoning duplicity, I was understandably confused. I thought, my mother does not know what's in this book. <laughs> or else she would not want me to read it. <laughs> After a few more chapters, I became convinced that neither my Sunday school teacher nor my minister knew the contents of this book. For all I knew, I might be the only one in my church who had ever read this book at all. It was a moment of great liberation. An errant nine-year-old stepped back from the brink of eternal damnation with this major discovery. The Bible was instructive, all right, but not in the way my mother thought. Rather than finding clear mandates about the importance of truthfulness and respecting one's elders, what I found were more family scandals than the afternoon soap operas. So I never could understand when politicians would say, we should get back to the Bible and good family values, when the first families of Genesis were showing every sign of dysfunction known to modern psychologists. When all else fails, read the instructions. A witty adage, but rife with inherent problems. Problem one, it implies that the Bible is simple, straightforward, and always able to tell us what to do to be successful. Well, I hope my story made the point. There's a fallacy here. I did not find the instruction that my mother was counting on to indict me. If I had used the Bible as my guide on the issue of lying, I would have concluded that deception is an entirely appropriate way to ensure survival and success, especially if you're an underdog in the social or family system. Problem two lies with when all else fails. This suggests that whatever difficulties we have can be fixed by following a prescribed rule or two. Our world today is complicated. Would you not agree? I find it so. Surely from your standpoint, it's looking pretty scary. Navigating it with moral and intellectual integrity is even more complicated. Just look at our current political landscape and the deep divisions among well-meaning people. But whether we're talking about politics or economics, cultural diversity, national security, climate change, healthcare, the refugee crisis, or the rampant violence that is creating it, the list could just go on and on. We cannot manage all the failures of our society by simply reading the instructions. Despite our wishful thinking, life cannot be reduced to a religious cliche. So what to do? As a Bible scholar, I'm not likely to advocate ditching the Bible. For one thing, I'd be out of a job. While the Bible might not provide all the answers we seek, it's far too important and powerful a book to leave it in the hands of a select few. Moreover, as I admitted above, the Bible is no doubt instructive. But the ways in which it offers instruction is sometimes surprising and not at all compatible with our obsession with sound bites. And so we come to the question of today. What does it mean to read religiously in a Bible-tweeting, Bible-thumping culture? In what has become a favorite text of my first-year students, A Rabbi Reads the Bible, Jonathan Maganet tells a story of working with a group of young Czech Jews in 1968. And I know that's <coughs> before your time, most of you. Um, these Czech Jews were attending a conference near Edinburgh when the Russians overtook the city of Prague, turning these kids into instant refugees. In the uncertain days that followed, they stayed on in Great Britain and participated in a Bible study led by Maganet. Although they had never studied the Bible before, they were amazingly astute quickly picking up even subtle nuances of the text. 
When Maginet asked them how they had come to be such perceptive readers, they responded, it's easy. You see, in Czechoslovakia, when you read a newspaper, first you read what's written there. Then you say to yourself, if that is what they have written, what really happened? And if that is what really happened, what are they trying to make us think? And if that is what they are trying to make us think, what should we be thinking instead? You learn to read between the lines and behind the lines. You learn to read a newspaper as if your life depended upon understanding it, because it does. Maginette goes on to suggest, sometimes the same applies to the Bible. Sometimes you just have to learn how to read. The young Czech Jews may not have been particularly religious readers, but they knew something about reading religiously, reading closely, reading with a sense of urgency, with attention to matters of life and death. They were not complacent readers, neither were they naive. As secular Jews, they had no illusions about the character of God in the Bible. They understood that biblical depictions of God are often constructed in ways that respond to communal quandaries and crises, and even ways that support particular religious, political, and social agendas. Reading religiously means asking, why are we being told this story as opposed to some other? What question was this story trying to answer? What was at stake for that particular community in that day and age for them to depict God this particular way instead of some other way? Who is visible? Who has agency? Who is invisible? and without agency. Whose interests are served by this story? <clears throat> Who is likely to be damaged? As explained by the young Czech Jews, this kind of reading requires some substantial effort on our parts, reading between the lines, behind the lines, turning the text inside out, attending carefully to what it says and what it fails or refuses to say what it does and what it fails or refuses to do. What would it mean to read the Bible like that, as if lives depended upon our understanding it? So by way of illustration, we're paying a visit to Sodom, that most sought after and frequently tweeted biblical text in 2015. So how many of you are familiar with the story of Sodom? Don't be embarrassed if you're not. Uh, there was a, a Barna poll of graduating high school seniors recently, and that poll revealed that over 50% of high school seniors understood Sodom and Gomorrah to be a married couple. <laughs> a heterosexual married couple, I hasten to add. So let me provide some framing. Sodom and Gomorrah are not a husband and wife who live happily ever after. Rather, they are two ancient cities divinely destroyed in the book of Genesis, supposedly for their great evil. In the Bible and beyond, the names of these cities become synonymous with total destruction and human depravity. And the story of their demise is commonly read as though it is direct instruction about a moral issue. In current Christian discussions, the assumptions are that homosexuality is the sin of Sodom this story depicts God's judgment on that, and we are to bring our own views about human sexuality into line with this so-called lesson. Basically, homosexuality is an evil condemned by God that warrants punishment. But while some people read this text as definitive guidance on a moral issue, other people experience this text as a weapon 
that judges, that labels, that oppresses. All over our country, we see division and fragmentation over issues related to sexual and gender identity. And at the heart of all this pain is how we read the Bible. The question becomes, do we continue to read Genesis 19 and other texts like it as some sort of self-evident divine ruling? Or is it possible that the story provides a different kind of instruction, something akin to experiential learning? Instead of imagining the Bible as an instruction manual, what if we were to think of it as a learning space? Who and what will we see? if we put ourselves inside the text and look around? What questions might we get answered? What questions might be posed to us? Sodom makes its debut in Genesis 13 with Abraham and his nephew Lot, recent immigrants to Canaan from Mesopotamia. Between the two of them, they have so much movable property that the land cannot support them both. The promised land, it turns out, is not empty and free for the taking, but is filled with indigenous people who also have herds that need pasture. Together, Abraham and Lot strain the natural resources, a situation unlikely to endear them to the citizens of Canaan. So the two decide to separate, and Lot immigrates across the Jordan and settles close to the city of Sodom. It is at this point that the narrator tells us that the people, literally the men of Sodom, were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. But the nature of their e evil is not specified. In the next chapter, we hear of a terrorist attack. A coalition of kings and armies descend upon the cities of the Jordanian plain, devastating the entire region. From Sodom, they take everything of value, including the city's food supply. They also take captives, among others, Lot and his household. When Abraham hears of Lot's fate, he musters his servants, tracks down the invading army, rescues his nephew and his family, and returns them to Sodom all with just 318 men. It's too bad we could not have sent Abraham after Boko Haram. We don't hear of Sodom again until chapter 18, when God and two companions come to visit Abraham's encampment. Now after a meal, when's the last time you had God show up for dinner? After a meal with Abraham, the three visitors arise to depart, and Abraham walks part of the way to send them off. It is at this point that God informs Abraham of what he is considering doing. The outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah, how great it is, and their wrongdoing, how exceedingly grave, literally heavy. I will go down now and see if they have done all together according to the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. God's companions then turn toward Sodom while Abraham and God remain. Now there are a couple of significant elements in this divine disclosure. First of all, the Hebrew word translated outcry literally means a cry of distress, a cry for help, a cry that comes from a victim of injustice, often a victim of violence. While the New RSV um, and the New Jerusalem Bible translates this as, translate this as an outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah, the Hebrew syntax is more accurately relayed as the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah. A cry of help is coming from Sodom and Gomorrah, and this plea for relief is juxtaposed with God's observation that the city's wrongdoing is weighty, exceedingly heavy. Who within Sodom and Gomorrah is crying for help? How are the cities engaged in wrongdoing? Victims and perpetrators 
oppressed individuals and systemic injustices occupy the same space. The second issue to note is that despite our commonly held belief that God is omniscient, the character of God in this story is not being presented as such, and this is an important factor to keep in mind. The implication of God's speech is that until the cry, this cry of distress reached his ears, until he read the tweet or watched it on CNN, he did not know that there was a problem in Sodom and Gomorrah. Now that the outcry, the plea has come to him, he is anxious to confirm the reliability of this secret intelligence. Is this fake news or not? And so in response to the appeal for help, he's launching a special investigation to verify the level of criminal activity. Note too, that just as the character of God is not omniscient, neither is he omnipresent. This God cannot be everywhere at once. Hence, he must send his emissaries to do reconnaissance. When God informs Abraham of this quandary regarding the city of Sodom, what follows is somewhat like a confirmation hearing for a nominee to the Supreme Court, the ultimate Supreme Court, you might say. But unlike Judge Gorsuch, God seems to tip his hand on how he might handle the case. Sensing that God might rule against Sodom without considering the consequences, Abraham launches a legal debate. You, you wouldn't sweep up the righteous with the guilty, would you? Ask Abraham. Suppose there were 50 righteous men in the city. Would you sweep it all up? Would you not bear with the place for the sake of 50 righteous who were in her midst? Far be it from you to act in this way, to put the righteous to death along with the guilty, as though there's no difference between the righteous and the guilty. Far be it from you. Should not the judge of all the earth implement justice? This is a bold, impassioned effort at intervention on Abraham's part. His argumentative attempt to hold God accountable will become a model for prayer in rabbinic Judaism. Today, it also offers to us a model of reading religiously. For despite the fact that God has not come right out and said that he's contemplating destruction, Abraham reads between the lines, realizes that there are lives at stake, and points out the ethical short-sightedness in God's plan. And the conversation doesn't end here. Abraham continues to press God. When God concedes to the plea for the 50 righteous, Abraham talks him down to 45, then 40, 30, 20, and finally 10. This interchange and the assumption that God is omniscient have typically read re readers to conclude that in the end, there simply were not 10 righteous people to be found in the city. An omniscient God surely knows that there are not 10 righteous people in Sodom. And since readers naturally believe that God is a God of justice and treats individuals fairly, they assume that the biblical God would surely only destroy an entire city if all the inhabitants were guilty. In other words, so the argument goes, this is not a real dialogue. God is simply indulging Abraham. But that, in fact, is not the presupposition behind the conversation between Abraham and God. Ancient peoples believed that the most usual ways in which the deities punished humans were through enemy conquest or natural disasters, droughts, famines, earthquakes, plagues, and so forth events of mass damage and devastation that were no respecters of persons. <coughs> Consequently, according to the ancient theological rationale, the gods might seek to punish an individual or small group, but their abilities to precisely target the culprits left a lot to be desired. Whatever punishment they might send would easily affect everyone around them. 
Israel will later develop ideas of individual accountability, just reward and punishment divinely administered. But these theological refinements are not implicit in this much older text. The assumption is not that God would be willing and able to save whoever is righteous before destroying the guilty. Rather, the assumption is that whatever punishment God sends will not be able to differentiate between those who supposedly deserve it and those who do not. God in this text has no smart weapons. His weapons are weapons of mass destruction. They cannot distinguish between the innocent civilian and the insurgent. Abraham knows this, and this is why he argues so vehemently for God to spare the city. More questions arise when we examine the language of the argument. Abraham poses the dilemma in terms of righteous, sadiq, and guilty, rasha. Immediately, the inhabitants of the city are categorized in terms of polar opposites. Either they are sadiq or they are rasha. So let's see a show of hands. How many of you are righteous? <laughs> How many of you are guilty or evil? Well, exactly. Well, polar opposites. This doesn't, this doesn't help us. Would every citizen of an entire city, even a small one, fit neatly into one category or the other? Rather unlikely. Who is being excluded from this conversation? Moreover, when he refers to righteous individuals, Abraham uses the masculine plural, sadikim, literally righteous men. So we are immediately led to ask, do women even register on this moral map? And even if we argue that the masculine is really gender inclusive, as androcentric grammar is when it's a matter of convenience, we still have a problem because righteousness implies right action and usually is applied to someone who has demonstrated meritorious behavior. In legal contexts, it can also refer to someone who is innocent, that is, someone who has not engaged in criminal behavior. The descriptor righteous, then, refers to someone who knows the difference between right and wrong, and who either has chosen to do something right or has chosen to not do something wrong. This is not a term that applies to someone who does not know the difference between right and wrong. In other words, this term does not encompass children. As we eavesdrop on this deliberation on the fate of an entire city, we may find the somewhat primitive theological presuppositions and the obscuring legal rhetoric somewhat troubling. And well, we should, for we have heard it before. It was not so very long ago that the moral majority leader and TV evangelist Jerry Falwell attributed 9-11 to God's punishment of the United States for its tolerance of homosexuality. In a similar logic, a representative from my home state of Louisiana claimed that Hurricane Katrina was God's effort to do what the New Orleans police force had been unable to do, namely purge the city of its riffraff. And some of you may now be thinking, reflecting on blanket statements <laughs> made in last year's presidential campaign about places like the south side of Chicago, or about particular groups of people, Mexicans, Muslims, deplorables who supported Donald Trump. This text is also starting to bear an uncanny resemblance to current debates over our own military tactics. If the image of God here becomes a cipher for any commanding personality having power over life and death, then this text has a way of turning the investigative tables on us. When is, when should violence be an obvious tool of justice? When we use violence as a response to wrongdoing, what is the potential for collateral damage? And should we care? 
One only need turn to last week's news to understand why this question is important. By mid-March, multiple mass casualty incidents attributed to US-led forces in Iraq and Syria made March one of the most lethal months for civilians in the two-year war against the Islamic State. The US airstrikes on the city of Mosul on March 17th are now reported to have killed over 200 civilians despite the Pentagon's demurring. According to Air Wars, a nonprofit group that monitors civilian deaths from coalition airstrikes, well over 1,300 Iraqi civilian casualties, perhaps as many as 2,800, can be attributed to American-led coalition airstrikes in the last couple of years, with the numbers escalating dramatically in the last two months. Several news reports have indicated that the Trump administration is attempting to dismantle or bypass the strategic constraints meant to prevent civilian deaths observed during the Obama administration. At the very least, they are decentralizing the chain of command. So fewer decisions by field commanders have to be vetted by any principal authority. In Syria, where an estimated 55,000 children have already been killed in the Syrian conflict, and in Somalia, U.S. airstrikes are now reported to be striking businesses, schools, hospitals, and even mosques. It seems that our president is holding true to his December 2015 campaign promise to, quote, bomb the shit out of ISIS. Who is obscured by this kind of bravado? women and children in the city of Sodom. So difficult to see them from a distant military command post or a campaign trail. And so inconvenient when trying to map the world with a binary of good and evil. As God and Abraham finish their exchange, we are finally allowed to catch up with the two men who are now at the gates of Sodom. This is for the first time they are called messengers or angels. As they enter the city of Sodom, Abraham's nephew Lot is sitting in the gate. He greets the travelers and invites them into his house. At first they demure, saying that they will spend the night in the city square. But Lot insists, and they follow him home. It's not long before the men of the city surround the house and call to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us. We want to know them. Now, if you've read any of the First Testament at all, you may know that in the Bible, the word know sometimes functions as double entendre such is the case here. The men of the city clearly want to know who these strangers are who have come to town without identifying themselves to the authorities. But no also has sexual connotations. The men of the city have violent designs on the visitors. This is even borne out by Lot's shocking alternative. Please, my brothers, do not do this evil. Look, I have two daughters who have never known a man. Let me bring them out to you. Do to them what is good in your eyes. Only to these men do not do anything, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. It's hard to read this interchange without a sense of outrage toward both the mob and Lot, an ancient version of using human shields. This is not the first time in the Bible that we would have seen this kind of female for male substitution, and it won't be the last. Biblical texts about travelers and inhospitable destinations underscore for us what, what these um, biblical texts about travelers and inhospitable um, destinations underscore for us is that the critical dilemma in Genesis 19 is not about sex, but about the domination and humiliation <coughs> of the stranger. The travels of Abraham have shown us that entering a foreign city or land 
brings with it certain risks, and one must be prepared to make sacrifices, even the sacrifice of one's wife, if one wants to survive. In the book of Ruth, the expressed concerns about the young Moabite woman being touched, harassed, and molested also point to the dangers faced by immigrants. An Egyptian wisdom text from the third century BCE communicates clearly what a traveler in the ancient world could expect. This text, known as Phoebus, after its reputed author, contains a series of fatherly instructions entitled, The Teaching Not to Abandon the Place in Which You Can Live. This instruction warns the young would-be traveler what he might expect when he wanders abroad. Everywhere, everywhere the stranger is the servant of the inferior man. He gets slandered by the people, although he does no wrong. Someone will despise him, though he did not spite him. He must listen to curse and abuse and laugh at it as a joke. He must forget the crime of woman because he is a stranger. The crime of woman is considered by exegetes of this text to refer to the violation of a man as if he were a woman. In other words, he must be prepared to endure sexual assault by other men, the ancient world's version of extreme vetting of visitors from abroad. This attitude toward foreigners, whether it be ancient or modern, is a recipe for harassment, humiliation, mistreatment, even torture. Consequently, we may note that despite his offer, the men of Sodom are not interested in casual intercourse with Lot's daughters. Their intent is to do harm to the strangers. When they grow annoyed with Lot's protest, they turn their hostilities to Lot himself, not because he suddenly becomes an object of their sexual desire, but because he too is a recent immigrant and now suspect for being uppity in his judgment of them. This one came to sojourn, they mock. He thinks to play the judge. Now we will do more evil to you than to them. On the verge of becoming the subject of assault and humiliation himself, Lot is, just in the nick of time, pulled into safety by the intervening angels. While the traditional depiction of Sodom is a city comprised entirely of crazed gay men lusting after beautiful visitors, we are starting to see a more complicated scenario. Not only do women and children emerge onto the scene, but when we piece together the rest of Sodom's story, we begin to relate to Sodom's sense of insecurity. Were they not recently attacked? Is it any wonder that the citizens of Sodom are suspicious of strangers, that they have developed their own peculiar version of a Patriot Act? Homeland security has been breached. What are these strangers doing here? Wouldn't we want to know what they're up to? And to what lengths would we go to find out? The angels, understandably incensed at their treatment by the men of Sodom, call down destruction upon the city. They do not consult headquarters. They abort their investigation into the cry for help. The others oppressed in Sodom are never located. The angels rush Lot and his family out of the city. As field commanders, the angels call in the airstrikes, and the rest is fire and brimstone. But Sodom's devastation in Genesis was not the end of its literary, moral, theological, or political career. While Sodom did evolve to symbolize the condemnation of same-sex relationships in post-biblical Christian writings, there is little in the Bible itself to support that interpretive trajectory. 
In other biblical allusions, Sodom became the byword for total destruction. That's the case in the book of Isaiah. Its evildoers were branded adulterers, swindlers, and corrupt officials, according to Jeremiah. Its sins were identified as arrogance, as having an excess of food and prosperity while they were refusing to help the poor and needy, according to Ezekiel. As refusing to welcome strangers, Matthew and Luke, and as sexual abuse perpetrated by religious leaders, 2 Peter and Jude. Post-biblical Jewish interpretation, reading between the lines and behind the lines, followed similar lines of thinking. Remember the outcry, the cry for help that is never actually unearthed in the biblical text? The Bereshith Rabbi explains that the outcry that comes up to God in the beginning of our story was the cry of a young girl who had been executed in the city of Sodom. Sodom, like the United States, must have had laws on the books that allowed them to execute children. The girl's crime? Giving a jar of flour to another child whose family was in dire straits. Another version of the story identifies the outcry coming from Lot's own daughter, who is given the name Paul Teet. She's executed for feeding a homeless man. Allegedly, the laws of Sodom did not simply protect the rich. They were designed to injure the poor. The poorer a man was, the more days he was conscripted to labor for the city. Hence, he could never have the means to escape the cycle of poverty. According to Jewish legend, Sodom was built in a territory so rich in natural resources that it was compared to the Garden of God. The natural abundance of its surroundings was a source of enviable prosperity. Its streets were said to be paved with gold. Its residents were so protective of their wealth, they did everything they could to dissuade strangers from entering the city. And if wayfarers did find their way in, the men of Sodom would rape and rob them, leaving them physically debilitated and too economically destitute to escape. Eventually, Sodom's citizens build a wall around their homes and possessions, and they flood all the highways leading to their city so that no travelers could enter. So President Trump's wall has an ominous precursor. Perhaps Sodom's many Jewish visitors over the years have something to teach us about reading religiously. They have read between the lines and behind the lines, attempting to uncover the lives at stake in this story world. They have found themselves and their community's problems inside these city gates, exposing a complicated place. Home to those who want to protect their community, those who want to hoard their wealth, those who want to monopolize and squander natural resources, those who shut their borders to wayfarers, those who are suspicious of and hostile toward difference, those who delight in being vigilantes, as well as those who cry for help, who offer hospitality, who mediate opposing parties, who sacrifice their children for the sake of principles, who live in fear for their lives and for their families, and who are at the mercy of powers that can wipe them off the face of the earth. Sodom. It turns out to be a remarkably unwieldy cudgel with which to castigate same-sex relationships. It has a way of not staying in the past and not staying on the page. Sodom, it seems, is starting to look a lot like home. 
And as for reading religiously, it is not for the faint of heart. As we would say in the South, it ain't for sissies. It's not for Bible tweeters, not for Bible thumpers, not for those seeking simple lessons or instant solutions to personal and social problems. Reading religiously means prying open, claiming space for hard questions about the Bible, about ourselves, and about the world we live in. In places like Sodom, lives are always at stake, maybe even yours. You may find yourself to be the suspect stranger are part of the bruised community who fears those who are different. You may be the one treated as if your life and well-being do not matter as much as someone else's. And women, you may find that your sexual and reproductive rights and safety are being decided by men who have other interests they consider more pressing than yours. You may all be the ones called upon to step up and defend the innocent caught in the crossfire of our war against terror. Look around. Look within. Look at each other. In this day and age, can you really afford not to read? as if your life depended upon understanding. That's why it's important to read in community, because there's not going to be any one answer, and there's not going to be any one uh, uh, interpretation. So how do we live with, with that sense of, okay, here's a text, and um, I, I, can't, I can't nail this one down. I can't nail it down. Um, so that's why I think that the metaphor of the text as a space, rather than uh, a directive, one-way communication makes more sense of how the Bible can actually work and work productively for all of us. It's, it's a living space. And so we have to live together with this text. And this is why it's, more, it's, it's so important to, to read the text with other people and to hear what they have to say. Uh, because we may find ourselves changing our mind about what certain texts are about or what, or what they can say to us. Uh, but in the end, it's, it's not a simple message, it's not a simple lesson. So the ultimate authority uh, in some ways doesn't match the excessiveness of the Bible because there's not gonna be one, there's not gonna be one answer. But maybe some of the rest of you would like to chime in on that.
some ways, it's like the newspaper. It's like the Surrey Bentley check to me. These days, everything you choose to read, you should be reading religiously. But if you think that the Bible is a sacred text, then let's imagine how it can work for us as a sacred text uh, without killing people with it, without using it as a weapon. How can it move us to a different place, uh, to, uh, to, to more enlightenment about who we are, what we can do to make this world a better place. So I have a question about the, what you just said, actually, the question of reading Jesus to death and Jesus. Um, but when I think practically about where people can do that or how people can do that, um, it's very difficult. It is. Yes. Um, where study uh, in New York for a while for just anybody who wanted to come. And uh, it was just going to last a few weeks on the book of Genesis. And six years later, <laughs> we were still meeting on Monday nights, <laughs> uh, talking about the text. And these were, you know, all kinds of professional people and, and homemakers and all kinds of folks that were coming because they felt all of a sudden that freedom that we can sit and talk about this text. No questions are off the table. Uh, we can you know, we can explore, you know, what's going on in these stories and these characters. So, proactive, I guess, proactive about creating those spaces. Can you identify overarching principles that would help you to measure your, the implications of your interpretation? Do you feel like there are overarching principles in scripture where we, we can look at something and say, definitely, No, I can't say it definitely could not mean that. I mean, I'm not sure there's ever a place where, <laughs> and, you know, unless it's totally anachronistic or, or something like that. But, but I, th I think um, probably I work a lot on ethical principles. Like, does this, you know, how many people does this particular interpretation harm? Um, how many people does this particular interpretation help? I think that's my rule of thumb, but I'm not going to give any answer that is going to make you feel good because I think about <laughs> I think about interpreting uh, the Bible like choosing a pair of shoes, which.
which I have bunions, so this is really important to me. You know, you gotta choose the right pair of shoes. So the interpretation, does it fit the text? Does it fit the text? Can you walk a mile in these shoes? Can you dance all night in these shoes? <laughs> can you kick some butt in these shoes? <laughs> I mean, what can you do with this interpretation? How, you know, how fertile is it? How comfortable is it? How well does it match most of the details in the text before it starts chafing and all of a sudden you realize, you know, I'm not sure these shoes in this text were really meant for each other at all. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's personal and it's, yeah. But I don't know, I don't know any way to get around that. Uh, except to continue to listen to other voices that have interpreted the text as well. Uh, not only those in the community that we can talk to, but you know, also listening to the interpreters that have gone before us and seeing, well, did they have anything uh, reasonable to say? Uh, is they worth listening to, worth, worth thinking about again? This is a little a different way of getting at the same question that you've been answering, but when you see this relationship
talk about a young secular Jew, right? Who is over that? How can we increase our capacity to promote this? Um. Well, it, it, that's always as a teacher, right? We're always um, uh, struggling with this, and and often I start with a set of questions, uh, hoping that students will get sort of comfortable asking some, and then they'll move on to those others. And and some of these are the questions that I was raising. You know, why? Why, um, you know, when you, when you consider the illiteracy of the ancient world, I mean, less than 10% of people could read or write even in the later centuries of the Bible. Um, so if you learn to read and write, that meant you were making a huge sacrifice to be able to do this. And if, if you're spending time writing instead of trying to support your family and uh, raise food and keep your livestock and all this sort of stuff. What you must be writing must be pretty darn important. <laughs> so, so to ask what was so important that people would sacrifice their time and maybe even their money to even get the equipment to write something down, um, what would be so important to, to put down? And what matter of life and death? I always think of it. Is there a matter of life and death here? Uh, whose life and death? Why, why am I being told this story and not some other story? Uh, and even when you, when you start to read the story in the Bible, you can always ask, well, why couldn't it have been told some other way? You know, the ending of Job. My God, who thought that was a good idea, right? <laughs> That. <laughs> uh, but if even to ask yourself, how would I have written this differently becomes a moment of moral reflection. It becomes an opening. It becomes a way uh, of, of cracking open the meaning of the text. So whose interests was this story written? Who's going to be damaged by it? Who's going to be served by it? What, what, what question was the story trying to answer? What other questions were out there that this story thought those answers aren't good enough? <laughs> I'm going to come back and make a new response. Maybe one last question. Is there one or one more? as many answers to that as there are people um, who are involved in such things. Um, and I'm no expert in psychology, but um, I, have, I have heard of some studies that uh, certainly in the United States, a lot of our attitudes um, uh, toward what we might say conservative and liberal uh, traditions is very tied to our view of what a family should be and whether families should be uh, ruled by a authoritative figures who tend to want to protect and support their family members, or whether they are more laissez-faire family, families that um, want the kids to make their own decisions and uh, create more liberty. Now, I don't, I don't know what the uh, data is on that, but that's one of the things that's been going on in uh, some, of the, some of the conversations, is that we have certain metaphors we live where we want to be protected and we think father figures do that for us, um, then you know, we want strong presidents you know, and we want to circle the wagons around our family units and our national borders and other things. Whereas you know, maybe we grew up in households where single mom and mom was always taken in strays and we're homeless and, you know, and then your whole view of family shifts. Lots of stuff.